everyone to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton, the series director, and we are thrilled today to be here on a Tuesday, not our regular day of the week, uh, to present pioneer and experimental maverick Meredith Monk. Uh, I want to thank our partners whose support has made today possible. The University Musical Society, our nationally honored jewel, now in its 138th season. Uh, and our series sponsors, Arts Engine and Michigan Radio, WUOM 91.7 FM. A special welcome to UMS patrons who are in the house joining us today. Uh, please do join us for more Penny Stamps events. We are usually here on Thursdays. We have a new calendar that's out in the lobby, so take one on your way out, uh, and plan to be here Thursdays at 5, 10 p.m., now through April. The event here today harkens to a continuation of the University Musical Society's Renegade series. This is a series of performances and special events that celebrate innovation and experimentation in the performing arts. We've had the great fortune to partner with UMS on hosting many of their Renegade programs, uh, beginning with Robert Wilson and Philip Glass back in 2012, and we're honored to continue to do so today. Uh, and I'm sure we have many ticket holders in the audience here today, but for those of you who are not, you have an opportunity to see Meredith Monk uh, perform Friday at 8 p.m. at the Power Center. Meredith Monk and Vocal Ensemble present On Behalf of Nature. This is her newest music theater work, which offers a poetic meditation on our intimate connection to the natural world. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have seen her perform before and wouldn't miss it. And anyone who has not will hear her speak today and hurry up and go out and get your ticket because there's not many left. But you can get them at ums.org online or you can get them at the Michigan League box office or take your chances and just go to the box office at the Power Center. And students, remember, you get half price tickets and rush tickets day of show. Please do remember to turn off cell phones. We are going to have a Q&A today uh, after Meredith's presentation. We are going to actually have our Q&A today here in the main theater. You will notice there's a microphone on a stand at the end of this aisle and one at the end of this aisle over here. So when the moment comes, if you have questions for Meredith, you can line up at either microphone and ask away. And now we have someone, another special guest here today for a proper introduction of Meredith. Uh, and this is someone who deserves an introduction of his own. For the past 30 years, he has been at the helm of the University Musical Society, and under his visionary leadership, this organization has experienced unprecedented artistic growth, diversification, and expansion of its programs, its patrons, and its partners. It's commissioned new works, and it's received significant awards, including the National Medal of Arts. Yeah. This is Ken Fisher, our dear Ken Fisher, who traveled to Washington, D.C. last year to receive uh, this medal on behalf of the University Musical Society from President Obama. This is the first university presenter to ever receive this highest award. Uh, incidentally, this UMS was awarded this national medal together with our guest of honor today. Uh, if we could have the next image, you can see Meredith uh, and Ken over on the left-hand side of the photograph here. Yeah, they were both part of that same cohort. And I have to point out, our own U of M dear George Shirley as well. So a very, very special moment um, for U of M and also for all these people in the photo. Uh, I heard Ken and Meredith talking about it backstage, and it just very exciting. Uh, so, and Ken has been a true supporter of Meredith's work over the years, as I'm sure you'll hear about from him, because he's presented her many times. So please welcome dearly beloved cultural captain, great friend and partner to the Penny Stamp Series, the president of the University Musical Society, lovingly known as the fish around the world, Mr. Ken Fisher. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Christina. You know, it is a great honor for me to be invited to introduce tonight's speaker, but it's also a great honor for me as president of UMS to be presenting our speaker in a performance at the Power Center again this Friday uh, at 8 o'clock in what will be her sixth appearance 
uh, under UMS auspices during my tenure, but you all need to know, and I gotta give him a big shout out, she was first here in 1989 with her ensemble, and it was Russ Collins, my great friend, who said, Meredith Monk belongs here and I'm gonna present her. So when you see Russ Collins, who's been running this place for over 30 years, you be sure to thank him for getting Meredith Monk started in Ann Arbor. So why is this such a great honor for me? Well, let me quote what was said about our speaker as President Barack Obama in a jam-packed ceremony in the East Room of the White House back in September of 2015 bestowed upon our speaker the National Medal of Arts, which is the highest honor specifically given for achievement in the arts conferred to an individual artist on behalf of the people. So just before the president placed this medal around her neck, this is what was read by the ceremonial officer. To Meredith Monk for her contributions as a composer, singer, and performer, Renowned for her groundbreaking vocal techniques, Miss Monk has reimagined the instrument of the voice with her innovative work. I was so proud to be in the audience to witness this great artist and my good friend receive this very special recognition. Meredith Monk creates works that thrive at the intersection of music and movement, image and object, light and sound, discovering and weaving together new modes of perception. Her groundbreaking exploration of the voice as an instrument, as an eloquent language in and of itself, expands the boundaries of musical composition, creating landscapes in and of it, uh, creating landscapes of sound that unearth feelings, energies, and memories for which there are no words. Her pioneering work in what is now called extended vocal technique and inter interdisciplinary performance, developed during a career that spans over 50 years, has led her to be called a magician of the voice and one of America's coolest composers. She navigates seamlessly between music and dance, composition and choreography, opera, film, and installations like no other artist. This Sarah Lawrence alumna received numerous honors uh, that you can find at going to her website, but I wanna highlight several here. The MacArthur Genius Fellowship, the Yoko Ono Lennon Courage Award for the Arts, and her being named the 2015 Composer of the Year by Musical America, which is the Bible of the classical music industry. Here's what Anne Majet of the Washington Post had to say ab about our speaker. She is at once fearless, unique, uncompromising, and yet builds human values into work that is never polemical and has communicated across genre boundaries long before crossover was even a term. And Alex Ross of The New Yorker wrote this about our speaker in the late 1990s. If Monk is seeping, seeking a place in the classical firmament, firmament Classical music has much to learn from her. She may loom, loom even larger as the new century unfolds and later generations will envy those who got to see her work live. Well, my friends, you have a chance to see her live not only tonight, but again this Friday, January 20 at the Power Center where she'll perform her full length evening work on behalf of nature. The LA Times' Mark Swed called it a rapturous new work, some of the finest music Monk has written. And the Washington Post, Charles Downey wrote, if nature were to rise up and speak in defense of itself, its voice might sound like a Meredith Monk theater piece. How timely is this work? Please join me in welcoming back to Ann Arbor one of NPR's 50 great voices and National Medal of Arts awardee, Meredith Monk. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I'm so glad to be back in this beautiful theater. I remember it so well. And, uh, and back in Ann Arbor, I always loved being here. I've just come out of three weeks of a horrible cold, 
Um, I'm going to try to sing for you a little bit today, but I'm not promising anything because I have, I've literally been in bed since um, around before New Year or so. Um, but I'm so glad to be here. Um, so what I thought I would do is just give you a little bit of a feel for the work and, and the process of making the work um, over the years. So my background is that my mother was a singer on radio. She sang the Muriel Cigar commercial, Schaefer beer, Blue Bonnet margarine. A lot of these, ad, a lot of these products don't exist anymore, but um, uh, she sang radio jingles. And I would be dragged around with her to one radio station, ABC or NBC, um, during my childhood. Her father was a bass baritone from Russia who had come over in the late 19th century. He had sung in concert in New York and opened a music conservatory up in Harlem. And then um, her mother, who I never met because she died when I was a baby, was a concert pianist. And they uh, recorded together on the Thomas Edison cylinders. And I've been trying to locate those, and so far I haven't been successful, but it's a, a very interesting search. So I think they met by her being his accompanist, and then they, they ended up marrying. And then his father apparently was a cantor in Russia. So long line of singers and musicians on that side of the family. On the other side of my family were came from Poland, and they were woodworking people. So the smell of lumber was also part of my childhood. So because of having this a wonderful musical family, I did have music through my whole childhood as a very natural language for me. It was as natural as breathing. And I sang before I talked and read music at a young age. Um, and my earliest training was in a technique called, uh, or a school of thought called Dalcro's Eurythmics, which was created by a Swiss composer in the late 19th century um, in order to teach rhythm through the body because he noticed that some of his students could not really find very complex rhythms. And, um, and so he devised these physical exercises so, so that you could learn music through walking, through skipping. He also, uh, you learned solfege, which is the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do system. And you moved in space a lot. But you, when you learned that scale, you brought your arms up. So there was this kind of sense of sound and space. And then there was a lot of improvisation. So I loved it. I was, an, I was a very uncoordinated child because I have an eye challenge, which is called strabismus, where the two eyes don't see together and make a, a fused image. So I think my left-right coordination was not so great. But somehow music was something so much part of me that going into that way of thinking about things was very, very natural, and so I learned my movement through the music, whereas the other children were learning their uh, body. I, I actually learned my body through the music. They were learning music through their bodies. So, um, and then I think something about that training really stayed with me for my whole life, even though I didn't realize what an influence it had been, which is that all perceptions and all art, uh, art, perceptual kinds of mechanisms come from one place and they can be woven together. So it's a really synesthetic kind of idea of art. Um, I went to Sarah Lawrence and um, they allowed me to make a performing arts program for myself, a combined performing arts. So I was in the voice and the dance and the theater departments. Came to New York um, in, a, in a wonderful time when um, I think that artists from different disciplines were trying to push past their discipline to find something new. And when I was still at Sarah Lawrence, I was making pieces where I was trying to combine singing and movement, visual images and objects. I was glimpsing the possibility of doing a multi-perceptual kind of way of thinking about performance. So I was very encouraged when I came to New York. And sculptors were making dance pieces and, and um, composers who were writing plays. There was a lot of interchange. Um, so my first pieces were very simple solo pieces that were mostly gestural, um, uh, some imagery, a little bit of voice work. And I usually performed them in galleries or non-theatrical spaces. And um, 
one thing that was wonderful about also that period was that there was a kind of anything is possible kind of mentality. And I, I try to maintain that to this day. And I think it's something that we all need right now in this world, that there's always a way to find something and anything can be found if you have imagination. So um, I started weaving together these different elements in, into one piece. And I started realizing that that was something that was very personally necessary for me. It was very urgent as a human being because I had these different interests. And I think it was a way of, of coming together as a kind of identity of my soul. But at the same time, I realized that it was something that had to do with the society as well, in that the Western European tradition was one of the only traditions that separated these elements. So singers sing, dancers dance, actors act. Um, and if you think about other cultures like African culture or Asian cultures or accounts of early performance traditions in ancient times, um, they were woven together and there could be one person that that within one body could have these different modes of expression and they were honored for that rather than here in the Western European tradition actually called a dilettante or you know, not really honored for putting these things together. So I felt that it was also a, way, a kind of healing modality of the fragmentation of our society by weaving together these elements and making a very whole form. We were affirming not only the richness of the performers, but also the richness of the audience. Let me just get a little water. So that was very encouraging. Um, and then after being in New York about a year or so, I really was missing singing full out. <laughs> I like putting the water down the middle. Singing, <laughs> full out. <laughs> so I started going back to the piano and just vocalizing regular Western exercises, which I still do to this day. And one day I had the revelation that the voice could be like an instrument, that it did not need words. Coming also from a movement background, I was very comfortable with nonverbal communication that within the voice could be male and female, could be all different ages, there could be myriad ways of producing sound and using the breath as part of a song, using the click of a click in, in the mouth, um, that it was a very, very ancient and primordial instrument and coming right from the center of the body straight through that could delineate energies and feelings for which we don't have words. It could delineate landscape, it could delineate character, age. So I, from that point on, I, I started working um, very deeply with the voice. So I consider that one branch of a big tree of my work over the years, and then the other branch is the pieces that put together different modes of perception. Um, one thing that I noticed right away was going back to the body, the heartbeat as pulse, the blood as melody, um, the, the fact that the, that the voice is embodied, that there is no difference between the voice and the body, they are one thing. And I think uh, a lot in, in the way that people are trained in our tradition in the, in the West, um, Western European tradition, sometimes the voice is isolated from the body. And usually the people in my ensemble come from either a voice or a movement background who also sing very well. And there's something about the dancing voice and the singing body that has, is very hol holistic. And you feel that kinetic sense of the voice when we sing. It's also um, a, a, a way of going back to nature and um, the energies of nature. So early on, I was spent a lot of time out, out in New Mexico working on some songs that I call Songs from the Hill that were inspired by just sitting out in this hill for hours on end and just letting the magic of that space come in through my pores and then making um, pieces from that inspiration and then making them into musical forms. So. Um, that was something that I realized right away, the connection between the voice and nature. And then I also started getting into, I was always interested in, in this idea of archetype, which is something that transcends culture. Um, 
So for example, if you're talking about what I would call an archetypal song form, a lullaby exists in all cultures. It's a very functional, I think probably the earliest song form. Um, marches usually exist in, in most cultures. We don't have a really good grieving song in our culture, but in others they do. We don't have a good rite of passage as a teenager, I guess, in, except for uh, popular music, you know, which is a kind of um, initiation kind of music. So I'm going to try to sing one song for you. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just sing it from here. I don't even have to go into the center. Um, and this song is um, a little song that I wrote years after I worked on these songs from the hill. I think I'll try a very simple, quiet little songs. Um, and it's, uh, I call it um, one of my duets for solo voice. And uh, it comes from a, a series of pieces called Light Songs that I wrote in, in the late 80s. And this is called Click Song Number One. Now, uh, I know one of the questions that I was asked to talk about, and for you students that are working on things, I thought maybe this would be helpful for you, uh, a little bit about the process of making a piece, because um, I get a lot of questions about that. So I think, the, I think of each piece as a world. Um, in the beginning, I don't know anything about it, and I try very hard to get back to that I don't know kind of mind, like in the Zen tradition, they call it beginner's mind. Uh, which means that you don't assume anything, you have no expectation, and then maybe you'll find something, whereas um, expert's mind means that you know everything, but you're kind of staying in one place. So it's terrifying every time, and I always think after all these years, shouldn't it be easier? <laughs> but it's not, but if you would really make yourself go to zero and not have any assumptions. So this, this idea of a, a, a making a, a world, or, or each piece is a world, that in some ways exists already, what you're trying to do is find the principles of, those, of that world. So for example, I might have a piece of material that I love. Um, it might be my favorite, but it actually, I can sense that it doesn't belong in that world, the world of that song or the world of that piece, so I have to let it go. So that's part of the the process of actually listening in a very deep way to what the piece wants. And then I think for me it's also a matter of finding the balance of elements. 
And sometimes when I start a piece, I actually don't know what the form is going to be. If it's going to be like a music piece, just a purely a music piece, will it be a musical theater work that has a lot of other elements? Uh, will it be an installation? You know, and then I also love to work between the cracks of the art forms and find a new hybrid, like, um, for example, a piece called Turtle Dreams Cabaret is kind of between a theater piece and a concert, and then it really turned into a kind of surreal cabaret form. So between the cracks of the art forms, I seem to find some new ways of doing things. Um, so what I usually say to myself when I'm really terrified when I'm starting from zero is, be playful, Meredith. <laughs> Playfulness is one thing. And another thing is take it step by step. So when I find one little clue, then I know that I may be on the right track. And that's very exciting because this, this idea of discovery is something that's kept me going throughout my whole life. And this thing of asking questions, I think, is something that artists do. And in a way, what they present is questions, not necessarily answers, but questions for people to go home and take with them and see how that, that is going to be integrated within their life. Because I believe that art needs to be useful in one way or another. That's what I, I want my art to be. So how do you, I make work that makes the imagination flow, that might make people look at things in a new way after they leave the theater or listen to things in a new way or figure out how, how their life might change a little bit. So that's, that's what I've been trying to do. Um, and then the performance part of it, um, which I feel very grateful to be a performer, is a, about as close to a meditation process as I, as I can think of because in a way the, the performance is when you really are at one with your material. You're not separate from your material at all. You are one with your material. You have the sense of pinpoint focus and at the same time total openness to what's coming to you in the moment. So you have fluidity and focus simultaneously. And then at the same time, when you're working with other people, what's so beautiful is that it's a kind of uh, prototype of what human behavior can be, like a kind of template of human behavior. Because when, particularly when you've been working with people for a long time, you can sense what the other person is doing, what their energy is like, and if someone's having a bad night, the rest of us can pull for that person. It's so utterly sensitive and also very generous. So um, that is the beauty of, of, of performing. And then the live performance, what's beautiful about that is that we are here and you are there. We are all here in the same space at the same time. We're doing a kind of infinity sign of energy, like our energy is going out and your energy is coming back and our energy is coming back and your energy is going out. And our vulnerability is right there. It's like a type rope is right in front of you. And that's very exciting and also I think very poignant in a time that we're living in where so much of our time is spent on a screen or on a secondary kind of um, source of information. This live embodied sense of touch, uh, which I think we are in danger of losing, is right there and, and in community. So I, that's one of the reasons why I love live performance. As much as I feel like a dinosaur, and <laughs> it may be that it's going to go into another direction, I think it's something that's um, very, very positive. So early on when I was um, doing my, my, my early multimedia kind of pieces, I started realizing that part of, the, of making the pieces had to do with that perception itself was the content. In other words, there was there's the images, there are the layers and transparencies and, and uh, simultaneous worlds and using you know, film, using uh, voice, using movement, that, that's all there. But basically, another thing that we're exploring as artists and we become art, uh, experts at that is perception itself and what does that do to human consciousness. So um, one of my big breakthrough pieces uh, early on, um, when I think I was about 23, yeah, about 23 years old, um, was called 16 millimeter earrings. And that was the first film that I did a, a vocal score all the way through. And I also did um, a fi my first film, film work in, in the piece. It was, that was so exciting to me because um, 
it was also the first piece where I did use some text. I was really working with these different layers of reality. And I was even working with, for example, singing live, and then my voice came out on tape of that same thing that I had sung, but it started getting distorted. So you started also getting the difference between the live performer and, and media. Um, so I thought of it as a, as a poetry of the senses, and uh, there was a kind of a cumulative soundtrack, and there were um, four films that came in, in different places in the piece, and I used the stage very much like a painter did, so it wasn't just on one screen. You'll see this little clip that will show you of it, of my face being projected on a big dome over my head, so it looked like I had a giant face over a little teeny body. So, you know, I was working with scale, very surreal kind of piece. Um, so that was a very, very beautiful um, breakthrough for me and, and it really changed my life. So I'd like to just show you just a, a teeny little clip from that. No. You got it. Oh,
trippy, eh? <laughs> I was very much working like a, a painter in a piece like that, very visual. And why, what, I, what I meant by poetry of the senses is, for example, I would take one image like a fire, and you can see those little, those little crepe paper flames, and then my hair very red. And at the end of the a whole piece, there was a huge screen where I had made a little doll, like almost like a little effigy in a room that looked like the room that was on the stage, and it, the whole thing burned. And then the, and then the, the uh, screen turned into flames and I came up out of this trunk. It was kind of like a phoenix image. So I was thinking of, you know, in a way, visual rhymes, um, thinking much more um, like a painter would than a, a theater person. Um, so that was a very, very important piece for me. And then after that, I started getting bored with um, playing in theatrical kind of situation, you know, very frontal, oriented theaters or, you know, the audience in the front relationship. And I started working outside. Um, I started doing what is now called site-specific pieces. Uh, one of them was in a building up in Woodstock with, uh, I had all these events going on in the windows of the building and the audience was down on the ground looking, you know, at, at the building. It was like kind of like a freeze with these little activities going on in the building, and then I had somebody up on the roof throwing down 50 pounds of flour onto the ground, and so, you know, big outdoor gestures. And I loved also the idea of working with non-theater um, kinds of objects, you know, a wheelbarrow or a flower or something like that. And I went on uh, working with also pieces that took place in different spaces. One work, for example, Juice in 1969, the first part took place in the Guggenheim Museum, and there were 100 people in the piece. A month later, uh, it was in a, a, up in the Minor Latham Playhouse at Bar Barnard College, and then a month later in a gallery, and you got one ticket to all three installments, and it went from 100 people to no people. In the gallery, there were just videos of the main characters, so the whole piece became like kind of a zoom lens. So this idea of disrupting time and space um, just trying to get past the habitual behavior of you go to the theater or, or a music concert and then you go out and have coffee and you decide whether you like it or you don't like it and then you go home and you for basically forget about it. Uh, I wanted to do something that was more experiential and that really disrupted your notions and um, that made you think, think in a different way or you know, just contemplate in a different way. So that site-specific work went through, and I, I still do pieces like that now, um, but that was one big line of my work. Um, little by little, the music became more and more complicated, and I was not able to, I, I wanted to work with other very good singers and musicians, instrumentalists, so that I could make more complex textures. Uh, so, for example, throughout the 80s, I had a vocal ensemble. We had made our first album with, it wasn't my first album, I had done two other albums, but our first album with um, ECM Records. And we did a lot of touring all over the world, kind of like a rock and roll group, you know, going all, all over the world doing music concerts, which I really, really love doing. Um, I made a f two feature length, I made one feature length film. Book of Days, and I made another half an hour film called Ellis Island. So th those years, I was very interested in um, film and also just the, the, the music concerts. Uh, and that was also uh, through the 90s, just in different kinds of configurations. At the end of the 90s, Michael Tilson Thomas asked me if I wanted to make an orchestra piece, and I said no. And I kept on saying no like, for a long time. No, no, no. And then, uh, you know, because I said, I, have, I, I don't know anything about the orchestra. And he said, Meredith, you have to just come down to New World Symphony and treat the orchestra the way that you do your ensemble. So bring your material in, try things with them. So I did do that, and it was a fantastic process. It was a two-year working process, and I made my first orchestra piece called um, Possible Sky and then made some other pieces for um, instrumental ensembles uh, like Kronos, I made a string quartet, and I made another orchestra piece called We for St. Louis Symphony. So the instrumental aspect of my music started getting richer, 
and you'll hear in On Behalf of Nature on Friday that the, the voices are like instruments, the instruments are like voices, they're very equivalent and they're very unified. And so that's very, very exciting for me. Um, towards the end of the 90s, I started thinking about how does one make a, contempl a contemplative um, performance work? Because um, I have been a Buddhist for many years in the Tibetan tradition, um, the Kagyu lineage, uh, but I ended up finally, after many years of, of meditating, taking my vows at the end of the 90s. And I guess I had always been thinking about, you know, what was a contemplative theater or, or performance or musical form because, you know, it's, it is a time that we can just refresh our minds um, and go to something that we, we're, we're not, things are not being pushed at us and that they don't necessarily have, to have the same speed that this world has. Drink. <laughs> Maybe we could let go of our blah, blah, blah that we have in our minds for an hour and a half or something like that. So it was something I've been working on for a long time, that you would come into sacred space. So, but in the early 2000s, I became even more aware of how would you spend your life, because you know the, the rest of my life, how would I spend the rest of my life making pieces that you can't make pieces about? Making pieces about something you can't make pieces about. And the contemplation of those things would be part of the process of making the piece. So the first one was called Mercy. So how do you make a piece about mercy? I mean, forget it, you know? So I mean, but just thinking about that, thinking about help and harm, um, making that the source of the work, and I, I collaborated with the wonderful visual artist Anne Hamilton on that piece. Um, then I made the next one um, was called Impermanence, which again is a kind of oxymoron. How do you make a form about impermanence? But And how do you make a, a piece that really conveys the fragility but the strength of our existence? Um, I had lost my partner and that was suddenly, and um, so my world turned upside down. And then about a month after that, I got an email from um, uh, a, an organization in England called Rosetta Life. And what they do is they go into hospices all over England and artists come in. And for example, if the person who's working through their terminal illness wants to make a Broadway show about that process, then they bring in a choreographer, they bring in a, uh, someone who's going to write the libretto, they bring in a composer and help that person make their, that piece about their process of dying or their pain or whatever it is they're going through. And I met these amazing people there who had, you know, a, a person who came from a working class background who had never written anything in his life and he was writing these amazing poems about his process of having a terminal illness. So they, they asked me, you know, could I, well they first asked if I could write music for a play they were gonna do with the stories of these people. And I said, you know, I'd rather, if you don't mind, make a whole piece that includes all the elements. And um, all I've been thinking about is impermanence. And so I started working on a piece called Impermanence. And I met these wonderful, wonderful people in England. We, we also laughed, there was a lot of laughter, a lot of exchange about pain, uh, pain management. These amazing, we did one thing of, of what would your, what would a fantasy of your death be? Like, you know, one of them was, I'm going to be in a rocket and I'm just going to, and when I die, I'm just going to be in this rocket and it's going to shoot up into the universe. And then little molecules of me will be in the, in the whole universe. Like people had their amazing um, fantasies or imagination about of that process. So m my other, thought when I was working on this piece is how do I do something that also is worthy of these people, um, you know, with my ensemble. So we made a piece that had two acts. And one thing that I definitely wanted to include was something that also had humor in it. Um, because I think that humor is something that just tr cuts through everything. And I've always loved humor in my work. So there's even humor in On Behalf of Nature. Um, and so, uh, 
Ellen Fisher, who is going to be performing on, on Friday, brought in something from the New York Times about somebody who uh, I think was in Oregon where they had passed a law about uh, that you could have assistant uh, die, de death process. She said, you know, I want to die and I want people to dance a polka after I die. And so Ellen said, why don't you write a polka? And, and I didn't write a polka, but I did write uh, a piece that was pretty peppy. And I was also inspired by the Mexican Day of the Dead, how there's so much humor where the skeletons can get married and the skeletons can be playing in a band. And you know, there was that sort of sense that death is part of life. And I, I get, I feel like we've lost that a little bit in our world, that it's part of this amazing process and we all are part of it. We're part of this big ocean. We're just waves in this big ocean of humanity. So I want to show you a little sequence from that called Skeleton Lines. Oops, no, that's not it. That's not, that's not it. Nope. That, that's between song. I hope you have it on there. I'm sorry? That's between song. <laughs> do we do we, we do we not have it? There we go.
So um, we're coming up to the present, and um, on behalf of nature is also in the line of mercy and permanence, songs of ascension. Um, and I think that my big inspiration for on behalf of nature was just my despair at what was going on in the world, and now you know it's jacked up a little bit more. Um, but uh, I was very, very inspired by a beautiful article by uh, Gary Snyder, and I think I include a little bit of that in the program that you'll see on Friday, um, where he talks about, it's called Writers and the War Against Nature. And basically what he's saying is that artists, really what we need to do now is we need to speak for these energies and beings that don't have voices um, and in human terms. We have to translate what they are feeling and needing um, into human terms. And, um, and that there was always a tradition of that, going back to the shamanic tradition in ancient times, and e even the ch shamanic tradition that exists still now in our native tribes and different places in the world. Um, there were two branches of this. One was telling the truth of what was going on in the society, and the second one was embodying these forms of nature and then making them come to life and making them go on living. So um, on behalf of nature is, a, is a, very, a, a kind of meditation on our interdependence. And when I took it on, actually someone said, you have to do something about this. And I, I picked up the gauntlet. And then when I started working on it, I realized, what have I gotten myself into? Because how do you do that? I didn't want to make a play where I'm saying for people to save their plastic bags or something like that. Um, you know, how do you do something where it's not pointy? And I think that one of the things I've always had a problem with words uh, in performance is that they do point something. And what I, what I try to do is make work that lets you have your own imagination. So I'm not telling you what to think or what to see, but more that you can find things within something that is presented in as open a way as possible. So after um, some struggling with, you know, how would I make a, a piece called On Behalf of Nature, and also realizing that almost all my music has a very, uh, has a real s sense of nature, um, the music was coming along really, really well. It was just flowing. Um, but um, I was trying to figure out what could I do in, a, in addition to that music, because I didn't want to illustrate or do something that was, um, you know, little playlets or something like that. So I chose to make the, the other elements, like the movement and gesture, very, very, very simple and very transparent so that you could hear the complexity of the music. Because usually, traditionally, when you have anything that's in front of music, the music becomes the, accom the accompaniment. And what I, because the music is very complex, what I was trying for is how do you make it so that people can really hear the complexity and th at the same time they're seeing something, but that something is very, very transparent. So it's almost like you're seeing through it and being able to also hear everything a as equal rather than an accompaniment and, and something that you is in the foreground. And because we're a very visual culture, that's what we usually do. So I, I had to give myself courage um, to have these other elements be that simple. And, um, you know, so that, that's pretty much what on behalf of nature, in a way, is a kind of affirmation of what we're in danger of losing. It, it's very much like an elegy and an affirmation of the processes of nature and the inner processes of nature and the energies of nature. I think that art... Um, is, a, is, is pretty addicted to distraction now. And, um, you know, there's a kind of seeking of diversion. It is really hard to be quiet. It's really hard to take time alone because the culture is just grabbing at you, and mostly that's to buy something. Um, but, but basically that, that impulse of filling space with sound, with... Uh, you know, screens with clothes, with you know, whatever the, these things is a very, very powerful addiction. So, um, I think that what I've been trying to do, and certainly on behalf of nature, has that quality, is to literally dig my heels in and say, you know, I am going to try to make an antidote to this. Maybe people will hate it, <laughs> have to run out screaming or something. But, uh, but basically, the more, the faster it goes, the slower I'm going. 
and, um, and I do believe that art is a kind of antidote um, to the darkness. I think that it is the light that we all can share, no matter, and it doesn't necessarily just have to be art. It has to be something that you love, you know, any kind of, of activity that you love, and just love itself is a way of getting through this darkness, and, and um, because um, violence just begets violence. It, it just doesn't do any good. So what I think that art can do is that it can bypass discursive thinking, you know, the narrator in your mind that's telling you about your experience, which is one step away from your experience, and it can actually give you a direct experience. If you can just let go and just be there, present. Um, so um, it, it allows us to see things in a new way and refresh ourselves, and I think it's also a way of remembering the big picture. It allows us to remember what we're part of and not that we're not the center of everything. Um, and so I, I want to just say that I just have great gratitude that I've been allowed to be part of that. Um, sometimes I pinch myself to think that music is, the magic of music is part of my everyday life and breathing and I've been allowed to follow my dream over the years, even though it's been a struggle, it's been totally worth it. Um, and I wanted to read to you a quote from Gary Snyder, the, the great poet, who I told you I was, I was inspired by. If you don't know who he is, they do consider him part of the beat poetry generation. I, I, he probably wouldn't like that too much. He's still very much alive. Um, but he was part of that group in San Francisco. He uh, is a Zen practitioner and a very, very early ecological activist. Um, so this is what he says, which I think is so beautiful, if I can see it. <laughs> um, art takes nothing from the world. It is a gift and an exchange. It leaves the world nourished. And I think that that's a very, very inspiring um, statement. I'd like to end by just playing you a little Jews harp piece, and then we can do our question and answer. Okay? Um, so this is a Jew's harp, a jaw harp, a mouth harp, a, in French it's a gambard, in um, Italian it's a scaccia pensiere, um, just a little instrument. Um, but when I first started working with my voice, my sister had one, and she taught me how to play it, and I started finding all kinds of resonances in my voice, in my in my mouth, in my voice, and in my breathing. So it, it's a wonderful singer's instrument. Um, my wonderful axe that I had for years and years broke, the dinger broke off it. So this is a new one that I'm just getting used to. It's a little bit more delicate, um, but um, I'd like to just play, play you this little piece.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. So, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say one other thing about being here in Ann Arbor, which I didn't mention, but I think I'm allowed to do it, which is that um, in the dance department, um, for their uh, concert, we are reviving um, three sections of a piece called Quarry, which was also one of the, my major breakthrough pieces that I did in the 1970s. It's a, a, basically a piece about World War II, but it seemed really important to bring it back now because of what's going on in our world now. Um, so we have these amazing performers from the school here that are going to do it. And Paul Langland, who was in the original cast, is here mounting it on them. Um, does, is anyone in the audience tell me what date it is? Uh, first, February 2nd. Uh, through the 5th. So please come and see it. Um, they're, they're just amazing, and it's a very, very powerful section of this piece. Uh, it's the dictator, da 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 da, and the dictator's rally, da 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 da. So I think uh, very apt for right now, so I hope that you'll come. Yeah. Uh, so, Christine, am I doing question and answer now? I think it's here. If folks want to line up, there's a microphone right here, and there's one right there. Anyone with questions so we for have Merida? House, house lights up? Yeah. And uh, Scott, if you can bring the house lights up. Questions? Okay, you got one on the left and one on the right. Let's, do you got sound here? Thank Lance? you, the people that are leaving, thank you for coming. Okay, um, I'll start. So I'm wondering, this way actually. Oh. Where am I? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so I, uh, you mentioned being up on this hill and you know letting the essence of the place soak in your pores. And I'm just wondering if you can talk about how you go about conjuring a sound that maybe you haven't made before or doesn't exist? Hmm. It's a mysterious process. I, I, I don't know if I would say a particular way. Um, it's very intuitive. I mean, sometimes I'll also just be walking down the street and something comes, and then I run home, you know, write it down. But um, I think it's more just almost treating your working process uh, as almost automatic writing and, and literally just playing, playing, and playing and playing and playing and playing and playing and playing and playing. And then maybe that very sound will come. So it's, it's a very, I, uh, for me anyway, it's a very, very intuitive process. And then I think the hardest thing is um, when I find it and then I, I might tape it, say for example, and then I make a whole form, and then sometimes I can't get the exact all the, but I can't get all the exact detail that I got that first time, you know, because that fresh time when you have that discovery, it has a lot of detail and nuance. And then when it gets put into a form, sometimes I lose that, and then I have to go back to the source, go back to the source. So that's the hard thing of making something that way, very intuitively, and then formalizing it, and then you, you know not losing what you had in the first place. Yeah, Thank you. You're welcome. This side. <laughs> um, I really liked in Skeleton Lines how the dancers started to play music and kind of that cross-disciplinary yes. connection. Yes. I'm interested in how you choose the dancers and the musicians kind of per project. Are you working with some of the same musicians and the same dancers or how the does that? All the people that you'll see on Friday, I've been working with at least 15 years 
every single person. And Ellen, the, uh, who was teaching dance and has the very short hair, I've been working with her for 35 years. Katie, I've been working with for 25 years. I'm a very loyal, I'm a Scorpio, so <laughs> loyalty is part of it. Um, but also there is something incredible about working with people for a long time and then trying to find, I love working with this group and then trying to find what is something else we have not uh, explored at all. And then some pieces is more, some pieces do have more of this interchange of keyboard and, or, you know, or instruments and, and um, voice dancers uh, because I play keyboard. You know, uh, in permanence, I was trying to get a much more, um, what would I say, um, uh, the flow between the musicians and, and, the, and the performers so that we did sit at the piano sometimes and we did perform sometimes and, and the instrumentalists came out and did one piece with us. In this, you'll see the instrumentalists come and they do movement with us. It's so great, but I'm not playing, for example, you know, I'm not playing keyboard. It's not, it's not quite as this way, but it's more that the instrumentalists get a chance to move with us and sing with us. So I love that, I love that, you know, thing of, of the skin being very thin, you know, and, and that, the, that, it, that it can have that flow. You're welcome. I didn't answer the other part of your question, but. Yes. Um, I read the New York Times article about you, and I wanted to know, um, wanted you to talk a little bit more about the turtles. Oh, the turtle article. I think my turtle is very famous. Her name is Neutron, and she is, I mean, she is the star of my Neutron. I've had her since 1978. Um, I was given, a, she was given to me by Ping Chong, who's coming later on in the season here, and her name was first Rosie, but we always were talking about how that we thought it would be so funny to have a, a turtle named Neutron. So her name's Neutron. And um, she's been a wonderful companion. I couldn't have a dog or a cat because at that time I was allergic to them. And also I go out on the road a lot, so I couldn't take care of them in a, in a good way. So a turtle is a pretty easy um, animal to, to um, care for. They need to be fed once a day. They have to, the heat's got to be uh, pretty consistent for them, but you know she is a, a tortoise. She's not a turtle, so she doesn't need to be in water all the time. And I've been loving being having this primordial, dinosaur-like, unchanged organism. I mean, turtles are pretty much for millions of years have been the same form, living with something from another time and who has another sense of time is something that has always been so. Um, comforting to me and it always makes me th try to slow down a little bit. Um, although she can move when she wants to, she can really move. And also she's, a, she's really funny. She's a real character. So when she eats, I mean, it's, it's like seeing Godzilla or something like that. She's like, she's like. I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing. So, is that what you wanted to know? I wouldn't say she's a super big influence on my composing. <laughs> she's a nice companion. Um, and early when I had her, when I first got her, though, I was having all these really strange dreams about her, about, I had one dream that her whole body, her shell was, trans she was completely transparent. So I didn't, I, I don't even know if she had an inner body, but this transparent turtle. And then I just was having all these dreams. And then I was thinking, I wonder whether she has dreams. And so then I ended up calling up Peace Turtle Dreams. And part of, part of that piece has a film in it where I made a miniature city. And Neutron was actually too photogenic, so I didn't use her. So we ended up using another tortoise. And he, his name was Proton, <laughs> by chance. And it's, it's a miniature city. And you see this giant turtle walking through the city. So you know, she was part of that piece, Turtle Dreams. <laughs> Any more? Hi. Thank you so much, You're first so of all. Thank you. Um, so as a multidisciplinary artist working in composition and choreography, I was hoping, well, I imagine it partially has a lot to do with your formative experience with, as you said, learning your body through yes. sound and through music. Yes. But 
Um, could you just talk briefly about um, about the relationship in your practice and in your imagination between sound and movement, whether there's sort of a synesthetic aspect yes. or how one begets another? Yes. Um, usually, it would be unusual that I'd have a movement idea first and then work vocally. Usually I work vocally first. But I, there's so many different ways of of working with the voice and the body in, in counterpoint, in para, parallel, um, one form that they're, they're a combined kind of form. So there are all these different ways of working. Um, sometimes, uh, as I said earlier, if if a, like for example, now um, three of four of the women in the group of On Behalf of Nature, Katie, Allison, and Ellen, and we're, we're getting a fifth person. We've just auditioned for a fifth person. Five women. We're doing a piece called Cellular Songs. And they're very, very intricate a cappella pieces. They're so intricate. So just to get the forms, we're just standing there like, eh, you know, I'm going, wait a minute, what happened to the movement? <laughs> so, you know, so now little by little, we're going to try to add the movement layer to it. But in a way, again, I don't want the movement to be too complicated because I want you to be able to actually take in the complexity of the musical form. Then sometimes you might have very complicated movement and you just do something very simple musically. In the skeleton lines, I, I, because of the record album of Impermanence, um, I rewrite music for, for my record albums, and I added a vocal that I do. And now when we do that piece again, I actually sing at the same time as we're doing that. So these things are it, they're the, just these things to weave together in different ways. And I think that the possibilities are limitless. You're welcome. You spoke earlier about finding both the masculine and the feminine within your voice. Yes. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the role of gender in your work and if you take that into consideration and what relationship that has yeah. for you in your work. In your um, I've always felt that we're, we're both, all of us are both male and female. That's something very, I've always felt that. Um, I, you know, some of the early pieces, I did a piece with Ping that we call Paris where I wore a mustache. Um, this was in the early 70s, a skirt and big combat boots. He wore a kind of more flowing sort of shirt and long hair. And it was very inspired by the Atje photographs of working class people in Paris. And it was uh, in the early 20th century, but also very inspired by um, silent comedy. And something that I found, and we were just trying to do some, first I was going to have a bear outfit on. Uh, we we're going to do a duet with me with a bear outfit. And then that went. And then I was like, how about a mustache? So I put on the mustache. And I found myself in, in comedy terms, in physical comedy terms, totally liberated by that. I was so liberated. It was very playful use of gender. You know, we were mixing our genders, you know, within each of us. Um, I, I really love that way of, of working with gender, being very playful about it, and, and no limitations and no doctrinaire principles in any way. I'm loving what's going on now, that people are really realizing that we all have everything within us, you know, in, in different balances, but everything is everything. And I think vocally, I always had characters um, that I thought of as male characters in the voice. Um, there's one called Old Lava Man, which is in uh, Volcano Songs. I mean, I've thought of my voice as being able to be womanly from a baby to a, you know, a very old woman and, or, or to a very old man or to a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a male character all the way through. So I think that it's always been part of my work, but I've never tried to codify it in any way. Mm -hmm. Hi. I first saw you perform when you were here in 1989. Yes. My size person, we have to bring the mic down. Is that better? Yes. Yes, so we saw you perform in 1989. And um, I am also a Scorpio, and I've played music my entire life. When's your birthday? November 5th. Oh, mine's the 20th. OK. <laughs> J J the same birthday as Joe Biden. <laughs> yes. OK, yeah, right, OK. Mine is the same as Guy Fawkes Day, actually. Right. So that's pretty cool. Well, the reason I'm speaking up right now is because the music that you make is very much like what I do. And it's my second vision, is forming a band to play this music with other people. And I figure that anyone that comes to hear you 
may be interested in meeting It's an me. advertisement for an audition. It is. That's what it is. That's exactly you what go, it is. You go, girl. And this takes guts on my part to you even go, say You go. It. You understand, though. So she wants anyone who is uh, interested in yeah. working with her, find her. And I'll just tell you just two or three things. And what is your name? My name is Laurel Emrys. Laurel. And I play very well, and my main instrument are flutes, and I use my voice as an instrument, and I play the harp, and I play the treble viol. Cool. So, yes, and I'm a well, wonderful Well, Allison, um, who's in our group, plays, uh, you'll hear on Friday, keyboards, she's a great keyboard player, French horn, violin, sings, and forget it. Yes. You know. I also have played the piano since I was three. Well, great. So, but I love doing this. This is it right here. And Good. thank you so much. You're so welcome. What you had to say was just remarkable. Thank you. Each sentence I could have fallen in love with. <laughs> so thank you. You made my so day. Thank I you. I will stick around <laughs> if anybody does want to say hello, and I mean it. Yay. A, li a lineage. A lineage. Go ahead. Oh, this one. Yes. Um, I was just uh, wondering if you could... I know you. Hi. <laughs> Guess what? He's playing with the dictator. One of the dictators. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, being both a composer and a performer and an engaged composer and, and working alone versus working, collaborating with other artists and your ensemble and how, yeah. you know, what, how that exists for you. Yeah, very good question. Um, certainly in my early work, there was no separation between me as a performer and me as a composer. I was my own instrument. Um, and there is something very organic about that. You know, I'm, I'm glad I'm both things. And it's torture for me to be in the audience when I'm not performing. It's actually, actually, strangely enough, I feel like I have more control when I'm up there than I do when I'm sitting there biting my nails <laughs> during an orchestra piece or something like that. Um, but then at a certain point, as I said in the talk, I wanted to um, make my textures more complex. And so I was able, it was right around the time I made Quarry and there were wonderful young singers. So I was like, wow, there are really good singer, actor, singer, actor, dancers around. And so I formed my ensemble. Um, how I, and then how I work with them and have over the years, and particularly people that I've worked with for a really long time, is I work alone first a lot. You know, so I'll either write things down or I'll um, I'm do multi-track tapes where I'm trying, you know, to do the counterpoint and everything myself. Bring that into the rehearsal, and we kind of work it over. <laughs> we've got we've got a shorthand. We kind of work it over. I might revoice it, or you would sing this, or we do this, and. We work on it like very physically, you know. Uh, it's like music is a very physical, hands-on, or sculpting. It's a little more like sculpting. Then I go back and work alone again. Like right now with Cellular, we had uh, we had like a, a series of rehearsals. Now I'm listening to the tapes of those rehearsals, rethinking, rethinking the forms, you know, working again alone. Then I'll go back in. So um, that's the next circle. So here's the little circle of one person working and being a composer performer. Then the next circle is being a composer and working with a group of people that you've been working with for a long time. The next circle is orchestra or like Kronos where I'm not performing and I have to make a whole score, which I really don't like doing, um, and hand it to them because they don't improvise at all. Or orchestra, you know, you've got like 90 people there and they've get, they get two rehearsals. So that has been very challenging to me. I work with Allison a lot because she's a wonderful, we call her score girl, um, because she can you know, in, um, work with the computer and make a score that somehow has some resemblance to actually what I want it to be. But we work very, very closely hand in hand, or, or also orchestrating together. Um, and that has been, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's in some ways really exciting and satisfying, and in some ways I'm not sure to this day, that it's the best thing for me. Because think how far away from my body that is. You know, it's, it's really, they're out there somewhere. What I have tried to do is with the, with the New World Symphony, I, I went down there for, as I said, two years and worked with these young people and we would do, okay, now the string section's gonna come. And I gave them all my material that I had written for strings and then, they, I said, can you try this? Can you do this? Can you hit the instrument? And then and they said, and, and we also can do this, 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 and this. And so it was so fun. And then by the t when the piece was done, they were so excited that they were part of the process. 
So I love that possibility of working with people that usually don't have a say. When I made my opera Atlas, I, we only had 11 instrumentalists, um, but I would say, you know, James would say, you know, the horn, I can use this mute and it, it can get that certain sound. And I was like, great. They will, these, they will never forget it. You know, the, these people that were usually in the pit, they never get to say anything. So, you know, that's also been very exciting. But a lot of times I can't do that, you know, because I literally have two or three, three, three rehearsals with an orchestra. And I'm also very dependent on the conductor. And also, my music looks very simple on the page, but when you put it together, it's very complex. But each part might be simple. Oh, we can read this down, no problem. Okay, you know, and then, and then try it. And then when it's put together, it has so much to do with also the energy and the momentum. And then the conductor says, oh, we'll just take these little parts, the hard parts, and doesn't play it all the way through, and then d does not get the form, really. So it's been challenging. Yeah. Last one. Um, hi, first of all, um, thank you for coming here and sharing with us. You're welcome. Um, so I was just wondering, and it kind of actually relates a lot to the, um, to the previous question and answers, um, but I, I was just wondering how um, <clears throat> improvisation uh, incorporates into your, um, into your compositional practice and also into your um, performative practice and also kind of what your preference is uh, in terms of like performers, um, you know, performers who, who generally play composed music and don't really improvise versus like really great improvisers. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you could just talk about that. I'm gonna just get a, a little bit more water here. Okay. Sure. I'm just doing that because I have to think about it. <laughs> um, well, I mean, my, the way that I work is that I'm improvising to find my material. Um, so, you know, and, and um, I'm, you know, really just, as I said to the other woman that I was talking to, just, I'm continuing just playing, playing, playing until I find something that I'm interested in and then I de start developing it. So that's um, very important. Um, I've never come into rehearsal and, um, and, and said we're going to have a free-for-all improvisation session um, because usually the way that I hear improvisation, it always usually come, starts sounding the same to me. You know, we all get into these ha improvisational habits, and there's a kind of quality about improvised music, or some improvised music, that sometimes goes back to a more generalized kind of sound, which I'm not so interested in. Um, so with the ensemble, it's more that there are sections in, in the pieces that always have room for play, play mostly rhythmic play. And they know the parameters very well. So, you know, there's always, we can always play um, within it. Some, some, some things are impossible to do that, like um, something like the Hocket, which is a duet. It is, it, you ha it is so fast and so precise that it ha you, you, you just can't, there are sections where we can um, stop it at a certain point, but basically you couldn't get through that form without really having it in your bones memorized. Um, and as far as performers that, you know, in a way, I, I love both. I love people that can, can actually precisely, um, you know, because I am very meticulous, sing a melody or, you know, or, you know, really follow a score and can improvise. I mean, that would be my ideal person, you know, that have both qualities, that can let it go and can also, you know, some, some people actually do learn better orally rather than on the page, which is fine for me, as long as I have that kind of level of musicianship, it's fine. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. thank you. I think the very last one. Wow, thank you for coming Good and for being here. Good to the last drop. Here. Yeah, <laughs> um, and my question actually is fitting, perhaps, for the last question. I was gonna ask you, you know, you've spoken about how um, even after a skeleton that you added in a vocal line yes. when you were doing the recording. Yes. And I was curious, how do you know when a piece is done? Or maybe that you don't work that way. No, it's a beautiful know. question because that's a question I always ask visual artists. I always <laughs> ask painters like, how do you know that if you don't put one more stroke in there that it's going to, you know, that it's going to ruin it? 
You know, it's a kind of crazy thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, live performance is wonderful in that you it always can change and grow. But sometimes, for example, we it starts evolving, and then we've lost sight of what our original was. Like, for example, for this doing on behalf of nature, we haven't performed it for a few months. I always go back to our first performance in LA for us to look at it again, because that's the source. You know what I'm saying? Because it can, it can start evolving and then loses the precise quality or that, you know, that it needs to be. But for the record albums, I want people to be able to hear them and not be thinking I'm missing something. So I usually compress the forms, I make them shorter. I usually add instruments and sometimes we'll add a whole vocal lines and everything. So, so in the real piece, there was no voice in that, in that particular piece, but in the album, that, the, vo the voice is very important. Mm. And that's exciting, you know, they, they, it does have that, um, the, I think my music has that flexibility that it can um, have in slightly different variations. Right now, we're in the process also of getting, um, there's a, a director that wants to direct Atlas, which is my opera. Mm. And we're getting these crazy scores that are just like scribbles. You know, we have to put them together. Mm. And they're literally two different scores. One is for the opera, and sometimes that score has longer durations because there was a movement component. You know, so there might be an instrumental section that took into account a, a, a very complicated movement component. Whereas again, on the album, I cut those parts out and just really went to the, you know, cut to the chase, so to speak. And, and then in concert, we, we did those more compressed kind of forms. I'm trying to see that we can get both of those scores in order because somebody might want a directed version of Atlas using the more compressed form. Ta-da, ta-da. Thank you so much.